as I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes on a subject which is perhaps a little abstruse, I must try and first of all explain to you what it's all going to be about. The point is that in these days we've learned how to use x-rays in a new and quite unexpected manner. They enable us to see into the structure of solid bodies and to understand to some extent how solid bodies get the properties which we observe them to possess. The point of the method is somewhat is easily explained. You understand that we use our eyes to see objects and to gather from what we see our impressions of their size, volume, appearance, and so forth. Now we use for this purpose the rays of light. And light we look upon, conveniently, as a wave motion in the ether, the waves having a particular size, or rather having sizes which vary about a certain mean value. The objects that we see are all very much bigger than the light waves that we see with. If it were not so, we should not be able to distinguish the details. You can easily get a picture of that if you think of the waves rolling in upon a shore. If the rock that stands out in the mouth of the bay is very much bigger than the waves that are rolling in, it will make its impress on the wave system. But if it were very much smaller than the waves, the waves would roll over it and nothing would happen. Now, when we look at a thing, we see it because the waves of light that have fallen upon it have been modified. And uh, the analogy of the rock will perhaps make it clear why, if your waves are bigger than the object you want to see, no impression can be made upon the waves and there's nothing that you can see. Now the fine objects of which a body is composed, the atoms and molecules, are extremely small. They're even far smaller than the waves of light. Therefore, there is an end, so to speak, to our power of vision when we think of those objects which are so very, very small. Not even the finest microscope that ever was made will bring us anywhere near seeing the atoms and molecules. But in the X-rays, we've got a new sort of light. A light which is something like 10,000 times as fine, as delicate, as ordinary light. And here's our new chance. And that which I want to speak about now for a moment or two is what this new light enables us to see. And when we use the word see, of course, we're not using it in the ordinary sense because our eyes are not attuned to these very fine waves. They're only attuned to the ordinary rays of light. So we have to use artificial means, such as photography and similar methods, but we can manage nevertheless to understand what these fine waves are trying to tell us. And in a word, we may say, with no very great stretch of meaning, that we actually can now see the atoms and molecules in a body. But there is one condition. This vision is only granted us when the atoms and molecules in the body are arranged regularly. For we cannot even now see a single atom or molecule but we can see a regular array. It's just as if you were looking, say, at a regiment of soldiers marching far away, and because with one united movement they all move their bayonets 
and the light flashes on them at one instant and you gather a spot of light in the distance. So by that regularity, you've been able to see something which you couldn't have managed without. There's a certain regularity in the structure of nearly all bodies. The regularity is manifested by the outward appearance. When it's manifested very boldly, bravely, you say, oh, here is a crystal. After all, a crystal is simply a body in which regularity has been imposed upon the arrangement of the atoms and molecules in it from the very beginning until it grew to be the size at which you see it. And ordinary bodies that don't look crystalline, nevertheless, are very often subcrystalline, we may say. Crystalline in that little groups of atoms and molecules are trying to arrange themselves according to the proper pattern, but never get quite big enough for you to see. It's curious how the X-rays have told us that ever so many objects we never thought of as crystalline really possess regularity of structure, are really crystalline. Even such things as rubber and wood and the cloth and the wool fiber, they all show signs of this regular arrangement of crystallization. Now, I won't try to describe to you how this is done because the time is too short. But now let's just look for a moment, say, at one or two of the results. Here's a model. Now, this little model is one of the very first that we made by means of these new methods. It's about 14 years ago since we first understood the structure of the diamond. I had the very great pleasure of showing this little model of a diamond in the United States in 1914 and at Schenectady and at and Ithaca and many other places. And the model has helped us much. The balls that we use to make our model represent atoms of carbon. But of course, the diamond is made entirely of carbon. The struts that bind them together represent broadly the bands or bonds that tie the atoms together. Then, what is it that this model represents? For I have to use a ball, a black ball to represent an atom, and a piece of brass wire to represent a bond, and the atom cannot be like a black ball, and the bond cannot be like a piece of wire. What is the left then? What is the point that this model illustrates? It illustrates structure. It illustrates how the atoms are arranged with respect to one another. And you see how, for instance, each ball is surrounded exactly by four, symmetrically placed.